to welcome you to Charlie Lake Community Church uh, this Sunday. Uh, last week we did this for the first time. Pastor Jared got us all set up and got us running with this, and so we're so thankful for that. This week you get me. And so we'd like to just welcome you to church this Sunday. I recognize that it's still a unique way to do things, a, new, a, new, a unique way to hear us and to see each other. Uh, but we give praise to God that, uh, that we have this technology, that if this had happened 15, 20 years ago, uh, we wouldn't even be able to do this. And so we give thanks to the Lord for that this morning. If you are uh, joining us and you are a regular member, you will have received a few announcements and just a couple of things that we want to draw to your attention. Uh, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Pastor Jared is going to be doing a kids live stream on our Facebook Live page, so just where you are at right now. And so that'll be 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. They're going to do a kids story time. And so if you have your kids available and handy and they're looking for something to do, we'd encourage you to be part of that as well. Uh, there's a lot that uh, we'd like to have going on, but that's about all that we have going on right now. Sandra sent an email to church members on Thursday, I believe, Thursday or Friday, just in regards to Jared's upcoming uh, Bible study and if there was interest in doing it via, via streaming. And we're just looking for you to respond to that email. If you uh, would be interested in doing it via online, uh, we'd encourage you just to shoot the, uh, the office a text message or an email just letting, you know, letting us know. And we're just kind of trying to judge the... Uh, availability or the desire to have this going at this time and so that's something else for you to keep in mind we have given you a number of online resources and I hope that you are taking advantage of some of those and, and the adventures in Odyssey they have the free trial the Bible app for kids the keys for kids mr. Phil TV which is Phil Vischer who is the veggie tales uh, co-creator uh, they have a free trial as well the group Sunday School curriculum is available uh, for us to use and look at, as well as many of you have the Right Now Media uh, already uh, at your homes. We'd encourage you to be using that. There's a lot of kids programming, a lot of Bible studies even for your family to do uh, together and with one another, so we give thanks for that. And of course, our daily bread, the daily devotionals, they can be found online as well. So every morning you can get the email of the daily bread uh, sent right to your phone or to your iPad or whatever you're using. And uh, we give thanks for that. And so in this season, even though there is much that has changed, even though there's much that is, is unique and different, we give thanks for all that is available to us and that we can use and utilize even in the midst of this uh, awkwardness. And so as we get started this morning, you will have heard some music in the background. We're working towards that. Um, hopefully in the next week or so, we'll have a live stream right from our website rather than on Facebook, and that will allow us to be able to put up PowerPoints and the songs. And so we're working towards that, and we're hoping to have um, something uh, special for Easter Sunday as well. And so uh, continue to be um, checking out our Facebook page, checking out the webpage uh, for some of those updates as well. So we give thanks for that. Let's start our service this morning in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And Father, we recognize that in our region up here, we've been hit with a lot of snow. And, uh, but we're thankful for that as well. We're thankful that even though it snowed, we could come and gather together as a church family from our living rooms, even from the church here. So Father, we just pray that you will be in this time. We thank you for this season. We know that it's not something that any of us would have picked or chosen for, uh, for how we do our church services right now. And yet we know that you have a plan and we know that you are in control. So Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that... Uh, that even in this season, your name can be proclaimed. So, Father, be with us this morning. Amen. I'd like to read uh, from the Bible this morning. From Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 to the end of the chapter, verse 38. And I'm going to be reading from the NIV this morning. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Our harvest field looks a little different this Sunday, and it looks a little different throughout the week as well. But we give thanks to the Lord that his harvest and the fields that we are to be proclaiming his name are still ripe, are still around us. And so we can continue 
uh, to meet in his name, and we give thanks for that. One thing that I will remind you of, if you are still wanting to give to the ministries of the church, uh, that you can do that by e-transfer. Uh, you can do that to office at charlielakechurch.com. You can drop off a donation to the church during regular business hours, and we're going to be here uh, Monday to Thursdays from 9 to 12. There will always be somebody here for sure. You can drop it off then, or you can mail your check to the church um, address as well. But that being said, I just want to thank you. In our first two weeks of doing this, our giving has remained fairly consistent, fairly constant. And so that, that, that's a pretty impactful statement to us as, as leaders and to us as pastors here at the church. So we thank you for that. If you haven't uh, in the last few weeks and you've maybe been putting it off, we'd encourage you to keep uh, giving to the ministries here. And, uh, but I say all that to say thank you, and you guys have all been a blessing to us here already thus far. And so as we continue on, I'm going to invite Rebecca up, and she is going to do a bit of a children's story for us this morning. In those days, there were some, in those days, there were some extra super holy people. At least that's what they thought, and they were called Pharisees. No, wait. What? Am I an extra holy, super holy person? No. Oh, okay. So I'm not a Pharisee? No. Okay. Okay. Just check. Every day they would stand out there in the middle of the street and pray out loud in big, extra, super holy voices. They really weren't praying so much as just showing off. They used lots of special words that were so clever no one understood what they were. People walking by would stop and stare, which might sound rude, except that's exactly what extra, super holy people were doing. Just like that? Yeah. Okay. They wanted everyone to say, look at them, they're so holy, God must love these people best. No, you and I both know they were wrong. God doesn't love, just love holy people. But there were people walking by weren't so sure. Perhaps you did have to be really clever or good or important for God to love you. Perhaps you had to know lots of different clever words to speak to God. So one day, Jesus taught people how to pray. He said, when you pray, don't pray like the extra super holy people. They think that if they say lots of words, God will hear them. But it's not because you're so clever or good or so important that God will listen to you. God listens to you because he loves you. Did you know God is always listening to you? Did you know that God can hear the quietest whisper in deep inside your heart, even before you start to say it? Because God knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Jesus told them, you see, God just can't wait to give you all that you need, so you don't need to use long words or special words. You don't have to use a special voice, or you just have to talk. So when you pray, pray in a normal voice. Just like Is this a normal voice? voice? No. Dear Jesus, like just like that? Y sure. Sure? sure. Okay. Just like you're talking with someone you love very much like this. Hello, Daddy. We want to know you and be close to you. Please show us how. Make everything in the world right again and in our hearts too. Do what is best, just like you do in heaven, and please do it down here too. Please give us everything we need today. Forgive us for doing wrong, for hurting you, for, for us, just as we forgive other people when they hurt us. Rescue us, we need you. We don't want to keep running away and hiding from you. Keep us safe from our enemies. You're strong, God. You can do whatever you want. You are in charge. Now and forever and forever always. We... We think you're great. Amen. Yes, we do. You see, Jesus was showing people that God would always love them with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. So they didn't need to hide anymore or be afraid or ashamed. They could stop running away from God as they could run to him instead as a little child runs into her daddy's arms. Thank you. All right. We have a special surprise for everybody today. I'm going to invite up my second favorite son to come and read the scripture this morning. Now, we had to go and get them last week from college, and so we're glad that they're back, and they're still taking their courses on video, and uh, we're excited for that. But Nathan, if you could come up and read, he's going to read Psalm 29 from the NIV this morning. Hello everyone, uh, today we'll be reading from Psalm 29, a Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord, the glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord, the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in his splendor of his holiness. 
The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The voice of the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The, vo the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes in the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives his strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with grace. We're going to try something different this morning, or not different necessarily, but we're going to try something spur of the moment. We're going to sing a couple of songs, and if you know them, we invite you to come and, or not come, but we invite you to sing along with us. Uh, but uh, Becky Kime is here today and has volunteered to sing a couple of songs uh, with us today. And so we're going to move the camera towards the piano there and, uh, and sing a couple of songs, if you join us.
really in the spur of the moment. <laughs> it's good. I think my voice warmed up part right in the first part. So I, I really hope you guys all know this one, uh, How Great Is Our God. I tried to pick something that uh, was well known here. So. that's going to be a little uh, vision of what church is going to be like. Some of it will be spur of the moment, some of it will be um, planned out, and so we give thanks that we have so many talented people here who just can, uh, at the spur of the moment, uh, just lead us in worship, and we're thankful for that. Before we get into the message this morning, I just want to uh, make a number of prayer requests uh, known to you here. We want to continue to pray for our healthcare workers in and around the world who are dealing with the COVID-19 virus. We want to pray for their safety, their wisdom, their discernment, their mental health. The amount of stress that is upon many of them right now would be very difficult. And so we want to continue to pray for them. Pray for Josiah Coop as he is uh, continuing to uh, be having some seizures. We want to pray for their family and that as, um, as these are happening, that the doctors will be able to figure out everything that's going on as well. We have a number in our midst who are going through cancer treatments. We think of Marva Preston and Gabby Sanders. And uh, many of our students who I mentioned with Nathan home now and Ben home, um, most of our students who are away are back home now and taking classes online, and so we want to just continue to pray uh, for them as well. We have missionaries around the world that are still, um, still sharing God's love in the midst of this crisis. We think of Kayla Thiessen in YWAM, England, and Light and Salt Ministries in Nicaragua, 
and of course Impact Ministries in Guatemala. I want to pray for Heather Anra, as many of you had seen in our email updates. Uh, she had a cousin who lives in the States pass away uh, just early yesterday morning from the COVID-19 virus. And so it brings all of this kind of closer to home for many of us. We want to, to pray for the unrest during this time, that God will give them grace and patience and peace in this very difficult time. I want to pray for Doug and Sherry's son Cameron as well, who's still in Vancouver in the hospital. They're putting him on a breathing tube this morning uh, just to help with his breathing, and, and he's getting other uh, subsidual pains because of the constant coughing and whatnot. So we just pray for the doctors in the midst of that. And Angel Sheppens as well, she shared with us this week that uh, she had an uncle pass away. So we want to just continue to lift them up in prayer as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this place. I thank you that even though there's, there's just a few of us in this building, that we are, are here worshiping you with those that are gathered online. Father, we give you thanks that you have enabled and equipped us for this season, not just us as this church, but the church in general. Uh, Father, to see all around the world churches gathering online, trying things for the first time, uh, learning as they're going, and, and, and just uh, putting their faith and trust in you, we're thankful for that. And so, Father, I pray that even in the midst of this time, that we will be able to be a light in the darkness that is this world. So we thank you for that, Lord. Father, we want to pray for our healthcare workers right now. Those that are on the front lines, those that are, are uh, working in the hospitals, we pray that, Father, you would continue to give them wisdom. We pray that you will give them discernment. We think of our researchers who are looking for a, uh, a fix for the COVID-19 virus, that you'll give them wisdom as well. Father, we know and we can see that we live in a fallen world, and this last month or so has really made that evident, our need and our, our, our desire to have you in our life. So Father, go before our doctors, go before our nurses, go before all of our health care workers, continue to lift them up. Father, be with those that are working in the grocery stores, those that are working uh, outside and, and have people coming in all, all, the, all day. Uh, be with them as well, give them safety in their jobs, and we just thank you for their willingness to continue to work in this time. We think of those that are, Father, not working right now and are not with a job uh, because of this crisis. We recognize that it impacts so many different people in so many different ways. So Father, we pray that you will continue to be uh, in the midst of those lives, continue to lift, and lift them up as well, Lord. Father, we pray for Josiah. We pray that you'll continue to strengthen him. Uh, we're thankful for medication that has slowed down the seizures. We pray that that will continue. Father, we thank you for their family. And as, as Josiah has these seizures, we just pray that you will continue to, uh, to heal him, strengthen him, and bring him back to health. Father, we think of those in our in our, uh, not our midst, but those that have used to it, attend this church that are going through cancer treatments right now. We think of Margot Preston and Gabby Sanders, uh, Father, that at this time when their immune systems are already so vulnerable and they're still needing treatments, we just pray that you will just give them a special, uh, just a special sense of your uh, control over their lives, that they do not have to stress, they don't have to worry, they don't have to be uh, stressed about what's going on and that you would have them in your eyes. Father, we pray for the, uh, the bronze as well. Continue to guide them in their future plans. Uh, we know that this season is, is kind of a difficult one to begin with and with all the changes. And so continue to give them wisdom. Continue to, to guide them to what is next uh, for their family as well. We thank you, Lord, for all of our students that are back home taking uh, school from, from a distance now. Uh, Father, as a, as a dad of two of them, I'm glad to have them home. And it, it makes me happy to have them home a bit early. Uh, but we just pray that as they're uh, adjusting to this new way of learning as well, that you'll just continue uh, to be with all our students, help them to finish this school year strong as well, Lord. Father, we pray for our missionaries. We think of Kayla Thiessen in England and Enlightened Salt in Nicaragua and Impact Ministries. Father, we pray that you will continue uh, to help them to, be, uh, to, to have an impact in their ministries, even uh, as they minister in different ways. We're just so thankful for all of them, their willingness to uh, be on the mission field, to be on the front lines, of sharing who you are, and so we're thankful for that. Father, we think of the Onra family as well, as, uh, as, as Heather has lost this uh, cousin to the COVID-19 virus in the States. Father, we know that it's hard enough to hear that somebody's died, but to hear that somebody's passed away and we don't have the ability to go and visit and support the family and to be with them, that makes these times all the more difficult. So we just pray that you'll be with the Onra family in a special way today. We pray that you'll lift them up. We pray that you'll be with 
uh, with her cousin's immediate family who are, are, are grieving and, and in pain right now, that you will uh, just help them to know that you are in control. We thank Angel Sheppens and, and the fact that her uncle passed away this week. Lord, we pray for her family as well. Pray that you'll lift them up, that you'll be with them, and give them guidance in this difficult time as well. Father, we continue to pray for Cameron. We thank you for uh, some of the progress he's made with his health. And we're thankful that he's in Vancouver and being uh, looked after by some really good doctors. But uh, Father, as they now put him on a breathing tube and, and, and kind of uh, put, him, uh, put him out so that he can breathe a little bit better and that it's not hurting other parts of his body, we just pray uh, that his body will begin to heal. And we pray for patience for his family as well. We have a Doug and Sherry as it's, it's hard to be so far away as well and, and, and not to be able to be part of this time. So we just ask you these things in your name, Lord, and we know that you are a good, great God. Be with me now as I bring the message to our church. I pray that you will give me the words to say and the wisdom and courage to say them. I thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, this is the first time for me to preach in front of a camera. It's kind of nice. There's a, a, a couple of people here uh, this morning, and we give thanks for that. And... Um, but we are going to continue our look at Mark chapter 14 today, but it was really difficult for me to decide how I wanted to go down this path. Because for many of you, you are living in with and in a sense of fear. Now there are some that are, aren't stressed, there are some that aren't worried, but the more I've talked to people over the last number of weeks, and, and the more we see what's happening in the world, for many people, uh, this has become a time that has been very fearful for them, a time where they are stressed. And even if it's not from the virus, it's, it's as a result of, of maybe the loss of a job, maybe uh, having to be home and not being able to work. And all these things have added up and compounded into our level of stress. And so I wanted to talk about the passage uh, of Jesus being arrested this morning, but I also wanted to pull in what it means to be fearful today. Now the unknown scares us, and I think that the biggest reason for that is because we like to have control. Now, I don't know about you, but I know in the last number of weeks, I have lost a lot of control. I have had to give up control on so many different things that, that, that it, it drives me crazy sometimes. And I recognize and I realize that there's a part of us that wants to control everything. There's a part of us that says, I need to have a say in this, and if I don't, I feel like I'm losing control. Now, that's one part of the coin that I've struggled with this week. The flip side of that coin that has been a rejoicing thing for me this week is I have sensed more and more and more that God is in control. There's so many things out of our control. There's so many things that we can't have a say in, and yet we're reminded right from the beginning of Scripture, right through to the very last verse in Revelation, that God is in control. And so we give thanks for that. But when somebody is sick, we give up control to God and to the doctors, don't we? That is when things are going craziest around us and, and when everything seems to be spinning out of control. When we lose that control, usually what happens is we tend to turn to God. We see that in many of the world wars that have happened where there has been a great revival, a great turning and returning towards God in those times. We've seen that at September, during September 11th, when, when the Twin Towers fell and the, and the planes fell into the Pentagon, and, and, and people had to take a strong, hard look at their lives. Not only at what they were doing with their lives, but they began to ask the question, is there something more? Is there more at play right now than just me going through life from moment to moment to moment? And it's times like these when we're forced to look at that, that I think God is in control. God knows exactly what tomorrow will bring. God knows exactly what next month will bring. And because of that, we can find great peace and great joy in that. But some of you are still scared. And for some of you, that unknown is too much. The schools are closed, many of the shops are closed. When we go to the grocery store, certain things are hard to find. And it assaults our sense of safety and security and peace. Now in the Gospel of Mark, and we're almost to the end, we've just got a couple of weeks left in our Mark 
uh, Gospel of Mark series, we see that uncertainty follows even Jesus as he prepares to go to the cross. Now, if you have your Bibles at home with me, we're going to be looking at, at uh, Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 72 today. But I want to start with um, just the, <coughs> excuse me, just verses 32 to 42 here. It says, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if, if possible, the hour might pass him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for just one hour? Watch and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. That's a very pivotal verse as we get to the end, into the verse, last verse of this passage. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And returning a third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, talking about fear, talking about uncertainty, I first of all, I want, I want to stress that I don't think Jesus was necessarily fearful in here at, at this moment. But Scripture is very clear and, 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 and very open to us. And, and he says, sit here while I pray. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. And we often forget verse 34. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Now does that sound like somebody who is going to the cross lightly? Of course not. Does that sound like somebody who's going through a season and a moment in life where he knows what is ahead is going to be more than he can take if it wasn't for his father? And so for many of us, we have looked the last number of weeks and we said, man, how are we going to get through this next season? What lies ahead? And I tell you right now that because of what Jesus was about to do in this moment and in that day ahead, we have nothing at all to fear. We give thanks. How many of us, though, have been at that moment where we say, God, take this from me. Remove this sorrow. Remove this tension from my life. I don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I can continue to go through the, what, you have, or what you're sending me through. Many of us have been to that point in our lives. For many of you, and we've heard a number of testimonies the last number of weeks, there comes a point in our lives where we say, I cannot continue to do this. I cannot continue to live my life the way it's going. And I need Jesus in my life. Now the very fact that Jesus went to the cross and he died for us gives us hope. Many of us, that's what we're, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for hope. We're, we're, we're saying, when can we get back to normal? When can we be hopeful that our kids can finish school? When can we go to the grocery store and, and see the shelves uh, full? And, and when we begin to really look at some of those things, some of those, those, those worries, those wants, those desires are things that have been asked in third world countries for decades, for hundreds of years. And maybe God is using this time of fear, this time of doubt, to open our eyes to look and to see what is going on around us. I'm speculating there, but my prayer is, is that our hearts will be softened for the needs of those around this world. That our heart will break for what breaks the heart of God. Jesus was stressed in this. Lord, take this from me. But look at what he says, yet not what I will, but what you will. Did you notice what Jesus is doing right there? He's giving up 
control. Which is what I just talked about is so hard for us. He was giving up control. The very thing that you and I are fighting for right now, that, that we're stressed about not having in our lives. And Jesus praised his Father, not my will, but yours. And may that become the prayer of our hearts as we move forward in the weeks ahead. Not my will, not my comfort level, but what will your will be, Lord? That is what our heart should be saying. There's a reality of what we can't see right now, isn't there? The, the fact is that we have so many unknowns, we don't know what's going to happen. And it's hard to understand, it's hard to believe in the midst of that struggle, in the midst of that tension. Now, we have faith in God that we cannot physically see. We can't physically see God, but I can see him at work all over the place. <coughs> Excuse me. I know that he is at work, and I can see him, whether it is in his, his, his creation, whether that's in, in how things are at work in my own life. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is at work, and he is working in our lives. You know, God created each of you just right. I know that we look at ourselves sometimes and we often see the ways that we wish we were different. I wish I was taller. I wish I had a deeper voice. But the reality is, is that's not what is going to happen to me. I'm not going to get taller. Uh, science says as I get older, I'm probably going to even shrink a little bit. And my voice isn't suddenly going to become a deep, baritone voice. And that's okay. I've had to learn, and I think as we get older, we learn to give up control on those things. That's out of my control. I'm not going to stress about that. I'm not going to worry about that. But I want to, and I say that with, with my tongue in, in cheek, kind of, because, I mean, wouldn't it be great to be taller? Wouldn't it be great to have the deep voice? But why would I focus on that when there's so much more that God is calling me to focus on? Things that I can control. And look how Jesus controls the situation here after his arrest, uh, starting off in verse 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a, cloud, or a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief of priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, J Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, Jesus said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching you in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Now, isn't that a visual for us? That the disciples, those that were gathered with Jesus, were so terrified by what had just happened that they were willing to have their clothes ripped from them as they were trying to get away. And they would run away to the safety uh, that they could find. This was not... A special moment. This was a moment of stress. This was a moment where the disciples realized, even though Jesus had been telling them over and over and over, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be put on trial. I'm going to be hung on a cross. But three days later, I will be resurrected and rise again. He had told the disciples and, and those that followed him so many times. But here is the reality of it. It's one thing when we're told something. It's another thing when it happens right before us. Now, one brave soul, and, and many scholars think it might have been Peter, had a sword or a knife, and he cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. And Jesus, in, in one of the other gospel narratives, takes that ear and he heals him. And he rebukes those and says, I, I, this is not what I'm here for. I did not come to cause rebellion. That's not what's going on here. And Jesus then willingly gets led away by the high priest and, and all, of, all of his uh, people. So often we're consumed with those things out of our control, aren't we? That we miss 
the big picture. The disciples completely missed that Jesus had told them this. The disciples completely missed that these things had to happen in order for what God's plan was to take place. Now think about some of you that, that have maybe been working from home the last couple of weeks and, and you've begun to miss your friends, you've begun to miss your co-workers. You know that, that co-worker that drives you crazy every day and you think, oh, i got to go work with them. Luckily, I don't have any co-workers like that, but some of you might. But those co-workers that, that you think, oh, they're, they, they drive me crazy. But after a couple of weeks of not having them around, you're like, man, I sure wish I could go and talk to so-and-so. I sure wish I could be in my office and, and, and be bugged by so and so. Our, our reality, our, what is important to us has changed as a result of losing control. And that, that happens here. Now, the Bible tells us not to be anxious. In Matthew 6, 31 to 33, it says, therefore, do not be anxious. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Saying, what shall we eat? There's been a lot of stress about that, hasn't there? What if the stores run out of food? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So here's what is in our control this morning. Here's the reality of what we can control. First of all, Billy Graham would always, would always talk about five points that we need to remember. And the first thing he would always say is, we are all sinners and stand under the judgment of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 says. We are all sinners. Every single one of us. Secondly, we need to understand that Christ, what Christ has done to make our salvation possible. God loves us, and Christ came to make forgiveness and salvation possible. So Jesus being arrested in this moment was something that had to happen. It made the disciples sad. It made all his followers sad. It makes us sad when we see it happen. But it's something that had to happen. It was ordained by God. Thirdly, we need to respond to God's work. When we begin to see God's work around us, and we've heard so many cool stories of how people are helping others in the last few weeks, not just in this area, but around the world. When we begin to understand the good news of God, we begin to respond to it. It should change our hearts. It should change our minds. It should change who we are. We also have to understand the cost that was paid for us to have salvation. The next two weeks we lead into Easter, and that will be made very readily apparent to each and every one of us. The cost that Jesus went through to die for our sins. But we have to understand that. It's easy to look around and say, well, he probably died for that murderer, he probably died for that thief, he probably died for that person who's never had it together. But the reality is, is he died for me as well. He died for my sins. He died for those times where I'm short with people. He died for those times where, where, where I have said things incorrectly and I've lied. And he's died for all, all of my sins. It doesn't matter how good you think you are or how bad you think you are. We are just as much in need of a Savior as all those that are around us. But ultimately, and the most important, is salvation is linked to the cross. If Jesus had started a rebellion in this moment and tried to get away uh, from the people, he, would, he probably could have done that. But he wouldn't have died on the cross. And that was part of God's plan, the sacrifice for our sins. The renewing of our hearts because of what Jesus has done. But look at how Jesus was treated in this time of crisis. In verse 53, it says, They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. So all the who's who, all those people that, that Rebecca talked about the story for you kids today that were very important and wanted all their prayers heard, this, all of them were gathered here at this time. And they went right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards. And Peter followed, sorry, at him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And there he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. 
The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then they stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of glory of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then they began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So they looked for all the evidence they could find. It is time. We're going to take Jesus down once and for all. And they begin to look for all the ways that he has messed up, all the ways that he sinned, and they can't find a single thing that he's done wrong. And so what do they do? They begin to call people to come and give false testimony. They begin, and, and, and false testimony is just a special way of saying to come and lie. Why don't you come and lie about what Jesus has done? Lie about what Jesus has said. And person after person comes and gives this testimony, and none of their stories line up. Not a single one of them. Now the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were smart people. They knew that what was going on was wrong. They knew that all of what was being said were lies, and yet they used those lies to try to gain what they needed for their purposes. It got to the point where finally the high priest says, are you not going to say anything? Now think about that for a second, because when somebody says something wrong to us, or tells a lie about us, our first instinct is to justify and say, you are lying, you are wrong, and we try to care for ourselves, don't we? And Jesus just stands there quietly and says, says not a word. And finally, the priest, the high priest says, Who are you? Are you the Son of God? And Jesus responds with, I am. Those words are so beautiful, aren't they? I am. He is saying, I am the Son of God. I am the Messiah. Now the leaders, they lose their minds here. They go crazy about it. And they say, what he has said, that is worthy of him being condemned to death. And then the abuse starts. And we're going to see more of that next week. But even in these last two verses here that, that, of this, this part, they're spitting on Jesus. They're hitting him. The guards take him away and they begin to beat him. An innocent man. We have nothing to fear, do we? Now, during that last sequence of verses, we, we found out that at least one of the disciples didn't completely desert Jesus. The scripture says that Peter followed behind from a distance, and he actually entered the courtyard of the high priest. And there was a fire, a bonfire there, and people were sitting around there, warming their, their, themselves, because it was a cool night, warming themselves by the fire. Now, as, 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 as hard-headed as Peter could be, we see that, that, that even though what he's about to do, deny Christ three times, we see that he at least was thinking, I have to go and be near my Savior. But look at what happens in verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she had said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. And again he denied it. 
And after a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Peter was fearful. Peter had every opportunity to proclaim that he was a follower of Jesus. And three times he said, I'm not that guy. And the third time he was so fearful that he began, Scripture says, to call down curses on the people and to yell and to swear and to make a commotion and a scene. It was fear. But the story didn't end there. We know that Peter went on to be one of the bravest, boldest men and apostles that we read about in our scriptures, even to the point of death. And we realize that even when we are in fear now, even when things seem like they aren't going the way we want them to in this season of our lives, that God and God alone is in control. So my final question to you today is this. What does the future hold for us? The reality is, is I don't have a clue. But I know somebody who does. See, God has a plan for each of your lives. And no matter what is going on, and no matter what stresses you have going on, God is in control. And God will continue to be in control. And God's sovereignty will be at play not only in Charlie Lake, not only in Fort St. John, not only in Western Canada and in Canada, but all over the world. The God who made the universe is the same God who knows every single one of our days, every one of your days. And because of that, I have nothing to fear. Now that's not going to mean that I'm never going to be scared and apprehensive and worried. I have all those things. But because of Christ's work on the cross, because of Christ's work in my heart, I know I do not have to fear. And I want to challenge you today to choose today whom you will put your trust in. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Maybe I can personalize that a little bit. As for us at Charlie Lake Community Church, we will serve the Lord. I want to finish with a story I saw yesterday at Cartersville Medical Center in Georgia. And they're a hospital just like all of ours where you can't go in, you have to do your, your, your physical distancing and you have to keep apart from everybody. And it has overcome the community and, and an organizer down there decided we are going to encircle this hospital with prayers. And so they all drove in their cars, they parked in a circle around and one of the local radio stations, a Christian radio station, began to play music into their cars and a worship service broke out. Now, when I saw it yesterday, I, I admit I choked up and I cried, I'm probably going to now. There's a video of doctors and nurses on the top of the hospital. And they all have their arms raised. And they were singing the song Waymaker, Miracle Worker, and proclaiming that God is in control. I thought, even in these times, even in the unknown, even if not a single one of us at Charlie Lake Church gets sick, that doesn't change anything that God is on the throne, God is in control. Whether we all get sick or whether None of us get sick. So I want to leave that encouragement with you today. Continue to seek after the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you love us, that you care for us, that you are our Father. Father, I thank you that you sent your Son to the cross to die for my sin, to die for the sins of those all around this world. Father, I pray that we would be proclaiming that with all of our passion and all that is in within us, not just during this time, but even afterwards. 
Father, may we be a light to this community. May we be a light to those that are frightened, those that are worried, those that are stressed. And we know, Father, that no matter what happens, you are in control, and we give you thanks for that. So, Father, we ask you these things in your glorious and your heavenly name. Amen. I'd like to thank you all for joining us this morning. We are going to uh, remember tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Pastor Jared's going to do a children's uh, time uh, for the kids on Facebook Live, so you can plan for that. Uh, every Sunday we're going to be doing this at 1040, and so we just love the fact that you are all joining with us, and uh, we give praise to God that we were able to do this. Uh, you're going to be getting a few more announcements. We're going to be looking at different ways we can maybe do this service. One way that we could do it is to stream it right from our website, which would mean that you'd have to click from our website instead of Facebook. But that would allow us to do PowerPoints and, and when we sing down the words on the screen and whatnot. And so it's a work in progress. We're working towards that. We'll, uh, as we've been doing, we'll keep in constant contact with all of you and uh, keep, uh, keep you in mind whenever we make any changes. Continue to pray for our church. Continue to pray for your neighbors. And uh, as we leave this place, know that God loves you and that he is in control. I just want to read from uh, 1 Corinthians right now. This the last verse here as a benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, everybody.